Last summer, More Perfect Union started a project that had not been undertaken in nearly a decade, reviewing the stock holdings of every member of the United States House and of the Senate. What we discovered is that when members of Congress buy and sell corporate stocks, they're not just padding their own personal wealth. Something much more corrupt is happening here. You can see it by looking closely at two major bills before Congress right now. Both of them have bipartisan support, both were approved out of committee, and both are considered a priority of the president's. But only one is on the fast track to congressional passage, while the other can't even get a floor vote. Why? Digging through Congress's trades, we uncovered numerous brazen examples of the corrupting influence of corporate stock ownership. And we realized the key difference between those two bills, the one that's set to be passed into law benefits the stock portfolios of members of Congress, and the other bill does not. I'm Crystal Ball, and this is The Classroom by More Perfect Union. How many members of Congress own stock? It's been years since any researchers compiled the data to answer that question. Well, we just did. And the answer is 49.7% of voting members of Congress own stock. That's 266 total members, 62 senators, and 204 representatives. Those figures include corporate securities and options that are owned by the members, their spouses, jointly, or by their dependent children. We found that 50% of committee chairs and ranking members, the most powerful people in Congress, own stocks. Plus, four of five House Democratic leaders and four of six Senate Republican leaders. Adding up the portfolios of every member of Congress, we determined that they collectively own between $218 million and $746.4 million in corporate stocks. We can't drill down on the specific amount because the stock disclosure law only requires members to report a rough range of the amounts that they hold. More than half the members of Congress are millionaires, and stock ownership is one of the principal reasons that members get richer while they're serving in Congress. According to a 2012 study, the wealth of members of Congress grew 15.4% a year, while the median working class American only saw their wealth grow by 3.7%. Take House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, for example. Her wealth grew from an estimated 41 million in 2004 to 115 million in 2018. In that same period of time, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, he saw his wealth grow from 3 million to 34 million. That's an increase of 1,000%. Has your total wealth grown by 1,000% over that period? Congress is getting wealthier while you are not, and it's principally because they own these stocks. And here's the key point about why all of this matters, because our elected leader's wealth is so tied up in stock ownership, it seriously affects the decisions they make about which bills do and don't pass Congress. Let's explain by returning to the tale of two bills that I mentioned earlier. So one of those bills would enforce stricter antitrust laws to crack down on big tech. The House version enjoys bipartisan support and was approved by the Judiciary Committee months ago, but it still hasn't gotten a floor vote. Speaker Nancy Pelosi wields the power to call the vote, but she hasn't. Why? As the stock watchers over on TikTok have long known, Pelosi is one of the biggest traders in all of Congress. That's right, you guys. Nancy the Whale has done it again. And Pelosi really likes tech stocks. Between 2007 and 2020, Nancy Pelosi and her husband made between five and $30 million in returns just from the big five tech companies that'd be Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. As of 2020, the Pelosi's own up to 5 million in Microsoft stock, 25 million in Amazon stock, and about the same in Apple stock. And they keep buying more. All of these companies would be impacted by that antitrust bill, leading to a direct financial impact on the Pelosi family. The Senate version of the antitrust bill also passed out of committee easily, with backing across the board from Amy Klobuchar and Cory Booker to Lindsey Graham. But that bill hasn't gotten a floor vote either. Importantly, it lacks support from powerful finance committee chair Ron Wyden, who describes himself as a foe of big tech. Nobody has been tougher on the big tech people than me. Wyden owns a small fortune in technology stocks, up to three and a half million dollars in Amazon stock, Apple stock, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Netflix, all the big ones. 
Wyden hasn't just withheld his support for that Senate antitrust bill, he also authored a provision that would punish other countries that try to regulate big tech companies over antitrust and other issues. Likewise, some of the most vocal Republican tech critics are also overseeing big tech regulation while owning tech stock. Marjorie Taylor Greene, who was banned from Facebook, she owns up to $50,000 in stock of both Facebook and Alphabet, the parent company of Google and of YouTube. Republican Congressman Dan Crenshaw is a very active trader. He bought Google and Amazon stock. When pressed about it, he admitted that stock trading is the only way he thinks he can make real wealth as a lawmaker. No one will run for Congress mm -hmm. because it's, it's, you have no way to better yourself. Neither Green nor Crenshaw have signed on to a Republican petition to force a House vote on that antitrust bill. So it's clear that lawmakers stop legislation when it might harm their personal financial interests, but they also advance bills that would help their financial interests. And that brings us to the second part of our tale of two bills, the United States Innovation and Competition Act. Under this bill, known as USICA, Congress will give over $50 billion in subsidies to very profitable U.S. companies that make semiconductor chips, ostensibly so that they can better compete with China. Unlike antitrust, USICA is on a fast track to becoming law. Why? Well, our investigation found that members of Congress own vast amounts of stock in chip makers like Intel and NVIDIA that are pushing for USICA. And as USICA has advanced, lawmakers bought up more and more of those companies' stocks. In March 2021, finance chair Ron Wyden declared his support for the chipmaker subsidies. In the months that followed, he and his wife Nancy purchased hundreds of thousands of dollars in stock in Intel, Applied Materials, and other chip producers. Many other senators are similarly conflicted. Senators John Ossoff, Sheldon Whitehouse, and John Hickenlooper own up to roughly $5 million each in companies that lobbied on that bill. Senator Tommy Tuberville of Alabama holds stock in multiple companies pushing USICA, Applied Materials, Texas Instruments, NVIDIA. The list goes on. Senators Shelley Moore Capito, Gary Peters, John Boozman, Tom Carper, they are all invested in companies who directly benefit from this bill. In the House, as of the end of 2020, members owned up to $7.2 million in NVIDIA stock alone. Speaker Pelosi or her husband have purchased up to $6.54 million in NVIDIA stock and options in just the past 12 months. All in, More Perfect Union found at least 26 U.S. senators and 97 U.S. House reps, nearly one in four members of Congress, now own stock in companies that have lobbied on USICA. These lawmakers have their personal fortunes tied up in an industry they have the power to sink or to elevate. Many of their stock purchases occurred as recently as 2021, when the bill was being actively negotiated and lobbied on. And that's the tale of USICA. This bill will likely pass, and many of the lawmakers that pushed it have a personal financial interest in it passing. Stock trading conflicts of interest are not limited to just two bills. We found that they are systemic, and some involve matters of life and death. Missouri Republican Senator Roy Blunt has been a vocal supporter and stockholder of weapons maker Lockheed Martin. He has literally posted their commercials to his Twitter account. In December 2020, the Senate debated a bill to block the sale of $23.5 billion in Lockheed fighter jets and drones to the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, due to that government's violent rights abuses. Just one lone Republican senator, Roy Blunt, rose to speak in favor of the weapon sales on the Senate floor. My personal view is it would be a big mistake not to move forward uh, with that arms sale. At the time, Blunt owned up to $250,000 in Lockheed's stock, we found. And by a narrow margin, to the benefit of his portfolio, the weapon sales were approved. Other Congress members have gotten in on this action too. House Republican Kevin Hearn, the Budget and Spending Task Force Chairman of the Republican Study Committee, bought two tranches of Lockheed Martin stock last year, totaling tens of thousands of dollars. Only two weeks after his last purchase, Lockheed won an $11 billion government contract to modernize existing fighter jets. And Wyoming Senator Cynthia Loomis bought up to $100,000 in Bitcoin on August 16th, at the same time that the Senate was drafting new regulations on cryptocurrencies. Loomis not only serves on the Senate Banking Committee, but was the lead author of a crypto amendment.
there's much more, but you see the pattern. So what can be done about it? In 2020, lawmakers introduced a bill that would bar members from buying or selling stocks, but it never received a hearing. In 2021, supporters of a trading ban tried to have it added as an amendment to House Democrats' anti-corruption bill, the For the People Act, but the Rules Committee, which is controlled by Speaker Pelosi, wouldn't allow it. We are a free market economy that should be able to participate in that. Dan Crenshaw, a stock trading defender, argues that members of Congress are no longer compensated enough for the job. If you want only millionaires and billionaires to run for Congress, then then keep making sure that we can't raise our pay, that we can't get a housing stipend, that we have to just spend um, spend or pay rent in two different places. Mm -hmm. That's fine. We could debate whether members should earn more or receive a housing stipend. But we do know it is possible to have a long, successful career in politics without owning stocks. After all, I don't own a single stock or bond. In 1972, when he was elected to the Senate, Joe Biden pledged never to own a single stock or bond while serving in Congress, and he kept his word during his entire 36 years in office. If Democrats want to win back the public's trust and eliminate doubt that their decisions could be swayed by their investment portfolios, they need to ban not only buying and selling stocks, but owning them all together. A new bill introduced by Senators John Ossoff and Mark Kelly does pretty much this, barring all individual stock holdings while in office, including holdings of spouses and dependent children, except in a blind trust. This is not a new idea. We already ban FDA employees from owning stocks in food or drug companies, and members of the Federal Reserve can't own stocks in banks. It's just applying that same logic to the people who make the laws, not only those who enforce them. After a public outpouring of criticism, even Speaker Pelosi had to backpedal, saying, quote, if members want to do that, I'm OK with that. If Democrats want to be the party of the working class, they should stand with working people by banning members of Congress from owning individual corporate stocks. Thank you for joining us in The Classroom, a series by More Perfect Union. This project is all about telling the stories ignored by corporate-backed media and seeking out solutions that will lead us to a better future for all Americans. So don't forget to like and subscribe.